and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and welcome to the Valley of the Judged. But I am not alone. We... <laughs> We, even though we are one week late and gay with this particular one, we have we have surprisingly enough a full house this time around. We have the man of the ma the face who launched a thousand airships, good good brother Ash. We have Hello. the man who is not who is early and straight this week, good brother Doku, and we have the CEO of Zadare Enterprises. Good brother Xana. <laughs> oh, here. Now you're all in here with us. Much like Rorschach in the prison. The fact that I'm early should uh, concern you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. So, as, al as always, we are continuing our look at the level up playtest documents, and this time we're going with the sorcerer. Not to be confused with his horse, Horserer. Keep saying that joke. It doesn't get any funnier. <laughs> Don't encourage him, damn it. <laughs> oh, no, no. You see, if I encourage him, I can undermine him. I'm just going to drink and let you look, guys it was a com <laughs> Look, it was a combination of D &D out the D&D Out of Context Tumblr and um, Too Much Parks and Rec. I'm going to drink and not let you go ahead. What are we up to today? <laughs> <laughs> um, now the the I'll get I'll get into the I'll get into the um co the stat the status of the so of the sorcerer um as it's as it's known in fifth in fifth edition. But we need to set a bit of the stage because the because. While some of the classes have had a have had a fairly consistent development throughout the editions, the sorcerer is is one that is a little bit less so. Largely because largely because of the because of its humble it's an interesting it's an interesting story going from its humble beginnings to where it is now. Now, technically speaking. Sorcerers were in AD and D as another spin on the Elementalist in um, Al Qadim. I stress technically because that version of the sorcerer isn't the one that we're all familiar with. The one that we're familiar with started in Third Edition in 2000, and it's, from my experience, wasn't all that popular, largely because. Yet, yeah, it, ha it had the approach of you can cast less spells than a wizard, but you can cast spontaneous. Which, the spontaneous casting is is not is nice and all, but a lot of people looked at it and that said th and said that's not really good enough to escape the fact that you're just a um, weaker version of a wizard because when a lot of people play um. We're, when a lot of people play association with sorcerers, they're usually thinking about the bloodline system. That wasn't really present originally in um, third edition. In fact, it didn't. It didn't really start to start to um, get start to fall into its own thing until bloodline feats were introduced in an issue of Dragon. Uh, Dragon and Dungeon magazines, two separate magazines. Both D and D based, mm -hmm. and you could find a ton of half baked classes and feats in them. <laughs> yeah. Um. Now, of course, there back before whatever was on your desk was cleared out to make a book. Yeah, but there there were. <laughs> it used to be magazines. <laughs> there were uh, there were other problems. For one, um, especially when you compared them to wizards, like. 3E wizards got feats got bonus feats every five levels. Sorcerers didn't. They only had two skills in their class skill list that be that benefit from their good stats, be that being constitution and charisma, while wizards had more and mo and benefited from 
constitution and intelligence as their good stats. Um, Sorcerer was most popular from creating the Palerer. Just yeah. Paladin Sorcerer. Yeah. Um, there's... Now, whether, now, technically, whether the Sorcerer is better than the Wizard in 3rd Edition is a DM-dependent thing, and whether or not, whether or not um, spellbook page limits are enforced, which I don't know about you, but I never really enforced those, largely because I didn't see much of a point. I only did it when someone at the table was being a dick. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you want to... You want to create your uber wizard and try and break action economy and make the game not fun for everybody else? How many spellbook pages do you have? That's too many. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's oh, the um, there was also now grant now granted some now granted a lot of this ties into the whole into the whole um. Having to prep your spell, having to prep your spells, and having to and having to learn spells the old-fashioned ways instead of getting them as you le as you level up. But that's um that's a topic that's ge that's generally revolving around fancy and magic itself. So that's um be that's beyond the scope of this particular instance. Um, of course, then in as I mentioned before in Dra in Dragon Magazine, the idea of um, bloodline feats were in were introduced. Um, which would all, which would, in, which would in, introduce some, introduce some traits, bonus spells, and, cer and certain restrictions. For example, if you had the air bloodline, you couldn't cast any spells with the earth descriptor. Um, and of course... And vice versa. Mm -hmm. They weren't official, but apparently somebody was taking notes during, during the whole thing. Um, then Pathfinder, um, took... Took this, both th both um, three point five and Pathfinder took this whole bloodline thing and ran with it. It was, it was kind of there in three point five, but not really. The bloodline thing really um hit the really hit its stride with its with its use in Pathfinder, um. Especially since ev everybody now had a unified um system of feat progression. But. There's and of course there's the fact that um, it decided to make more of the charisma skills class skills for the for the sorcerer, which it always should have had. And Since they cast by force of personality. And they brought and they brought in um, they brought in the they brought in um, bloodline powers. However, throughout this thing, the the thing that I, the thing that I find very interesting. Is the fact that sor the fact that sorcerers by this point were starting to devolve into we're start not devolve but starting to morph into the blaster centric type of caster that they would be they don't they using using the fact that they could throw around offensive spells like nobody's business what despite and in exchange for their lack of um, versatility that a wizard is supposed to have keyword here is supposed to um then there then there then there were although some i will note that some of the um some of the blood some of the bloodlines that were suggested given the given the supposed origin of sorcerers was a little bit um suspect for exa for example um for example undead uh. <laughs> um Eh, or or um, I th I think there I th I do recall that there was one that was fr that was the equivalent of your one of your of you have one of your parents is a fucking warforged. Hmm. Which um. That's a, that's a wish spell into half in the making. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm also I'm also pretty sure that's that's um that's. Wait, is it? it I'm sure that's been suggested at least once by an Adeptus Mechanicus. Either that, or it's it's uh, the love child of Data and Tasha Yar. I'd rather not think about that. <laughs> um, hey, they, they suffered the same virus that the original series did. Yep. 
there was uh, there was also what there was also one in one book of in one Pathfinder book uh that was a nanite bloodline. Literally nano machine son. <laughs> so they they were they wait wait a minute. Was that was that Monty Cook? Monty Cook, was that you? Numenera, what? <laughs> Nanite says magic, what? Okay, okay. Um, Clearly, Monty Cook was was on drugs and got inspiration from that specific bloodline. That's what happened. Clearly, <laughs> and of course, that would be maintained with Pathfinder Second Edition. Um, Fourth Edition decide, decided to bi decided to basically take up the Evoker niche. There, with a lot of with a lot of a lot of spellcasters, there's always the question of what sort of elemental damage they can do. The Fourth Edition Sorcerer, the answer to that question is yes. They can I do... do thunder damage? Yes, you can. Not only not only that, you have cases where you can do multiple types of elemental damage at the same time. You know, it'd be funny to make them do necrotic and radiant damage at the same time. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure a canny enough build could pull that off. Um, that that would be f fucking stupid. Yeah. <laughs> But they were basically they basically evolved into a midway point between the wizard and the warlock. Um, that and the action, that and fourth edition is where they finally nailed down where the hell they get their powers from. Um, and thus we start with the whole um, origin thing because something I, something I've been making clear is that five E takes a lot takes a lot more um, nods from fourth edition than it's than a lot of diehards are willing to admit. See, as someone who didn't have a, a an opportunity to play fourth, it's interesting to see those parallels. Mm -hmm. Now, this brings me to it to a stake with um fifth. Now, sor sorcerers, I don't see, I see them getting picked a fair amount, but I don't, but I don't see them getting picked as as often as some other class as some other casters. They're they, in my experience, they kind of they seem to be in the middle. Um, Ash, what Ash? Um, I think I, if I recall correctly, I asked you to look to look into a bit of into the numbers on that. Were sor were sorcerers that high of a pick? Based on, <clears throat> sorry, allow me, allow me to clear my throat and such. Uh, so they were not on the five top. Like the the top five were fighter, rogue, barbarian, wizard, and paladin. But this is based on the D and D Beyond statistics, mm -hmm. which is important. But just just when it comes to the casting, just when it comes to the casting classes, um, it sounds it sounds like pal. It's what like just between um just between warlock with. Wizard and sorcerer, which it which is the highest. That's not all the casting classes, but it was at let's see here. It sits at seven percent. Druids are at six percent. Bards are at seven percent. Wizards and warlocks. Wizards and warlocks both beat it out. Warlocks doesn't surprise me. They're warlocks are kind of a of, of a from base kind of a very. Uh, attractive class with all the fun little things they get yeah it's it's no surprise it's no i see warlocks a lot and that's no surprise given given their um given their gifts um and the the wizard being more popular kind, kind of surprises me because when we did the reconstruction um on D, &D classes thing um thing a while back I remember you had some very strong opinions on the wizard, Ash. Uh, I did. However, these are, again, this is where it comes into the fact that these are people making their characters on D&D Beyond, and if your impression of the wizard is that, or your impression of what you want this character to be, is that your expectation is that this is going to be somebody who does a lot of magic at one given time and isn't the party wheelbarrow who moonlights as a source of fireballs, you're going to make the wizard, only to be sadly disappointed la later. And you might not realize. 
realize why. I love the fact that you called it the party wheelbarrow that is also a source of fireballs, because that is what wizards are. Yep. <laughs> it's a spawning disc or fireball. Mm-hmm. Um, Grease fireball is always one of my favorite combos. Well, some people apparently have caught up on it, because the, the, the most common school, apparently, is the school of evocation when it's created on D&D Beyond. So some people leaned into it. They're like, yeah, the uh, School of Fireball. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the School of Fireball Wizard. And indeed, Evocation is one of the best uh, is one of the best designed schools. Fits best with the wizard in general. But when it comes to the sorcerer, it's I'm I'm excited to talk about what we have here. Yeah. Now of course of course the changes that the changes that happened with the five E sorcerer is one it got exclusive access to to meta magic and and if you listen closely you can hear the, you can hear wizard players everywhere um cr- um crying salty salty tears um a million nerds cried out and were suddenly snuffed mm-hmm. by Watsy. yeah um as well as the introduction of sorcery points that are used for that are used for meta magic or co- or could be used to um to met to um do to do some spell swapping and this is this is where the, this is where there's a bit of discuss a bit of discussion regarding the regarding um regarding the cl- regarding the class um because because a major ar- a major argument that's that's made is that is that they have they um they have as much spell access as the as the paladin but don't have any unique spells and uh, not having any short rest short rest benefits until what's the until what's the discussion um like I, I remember there was an argument that I remember being privy to where where the, where it was being brought up that they get as much access at to they get access to as many spells as quarter casters, like paladins and rangers, but don't have Which any is, unique. What, spells. What's the argument? I, that's a that's a statement. I don't understand the. Um, the was argu- this person complaining about it, or the the arg the argument is that is that because of, is that the fact that they don't have the the lack of unique spells makes makes them a gimped wizard. In fifth edition, that that was one of the arguments that was presented. I'd say that's technically wrong in a in an odd fashion because wizards on their own don't have a ton of short rest features. Some of the some of the different traditions or schools, I guess, have some short rest features, especially once you move on into the splat books. And sorcerers don't have many short rest features to begin with, but that doesn't mean that they don't have some transient resources that they can bring to bear. It was notably in the form of meta magic. I mean, the the fact that they're able to use meta magic and then use their spell slots, often which are being left over, to fuel said met, meta magic means I I don't think that the wizard is I don't think the sorcerer is a gimp wizard. I think the wizard is a gimp sorcerer. Um, that that being the lack of spell selection and the lack of spell avail spell the availability of spells known is is hideous. Though I'll completely agree on that one. Yeah. Um. That there's um some I've seen some take issue with the fact that they don't that they don't have access to ritual casting, but ri- but really um I don't. How would they know know the rituals unless they studied them? Yeah. Ritual them not having ritual casting makes perfect sense because they're supposed to be instinctive. Um, magic users. There's, there's no, there's no, uh, no role play hook for it. I mean, you could always argue for a mechanical hook, but then you'd just be looking to, to substitute mechanics over the mechanics. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, with the sorcerers in fifth, um, honestly, I, I do see them underplayed when, when I was playing. And but but when they were played, you could see some 
massively weird plays that just panned out in the oddest ways, and I loved it. Even if they weren't, you know, using the wild magic rules or, or, or anything like that, or, or any of the, the different sorceress origins that, you know, that gave a little bit of chaos to casting. Uh, just the way that I saw some players using meta magic was... Yes, the sorcerer was being a blaster caster because the sorcerer is a blaster caster. I mean, the, the, there's a reason that some people try to illogically compare sorcerers to DBZ. Um, but someone using, I think my favorite one was a was a twinned fireball. That was that was an interesting role to watch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, <sighs> I've seen I've seen some suggest that that um sorcerers should get a should get a set of um of bloodline spells attached to ar- attached to archetypes. But why though? Um, because they have a crappy selection and they have a lack of actual selection overall. I think the total number is fifteen. Is the number that they could take? Yeah, yeah. but spells known at level twenty. That's unacceptable. Yes, the, the, the overall lack of, of selection is definitely a terrible travesty, and although WotC will never feel bad about it, they should. Um, <laughs> I felt bad enough in, in future iterations of the Sorcerer to start giving different bloodlines different spells. And they did that, they started doing that actually quite frequently in order to shore up underperforming classes or subclasses. I don't think that's because they felt bad. That's just because they wanted they they want parity between class use, and, even though they'll never yeah. achieve that. That that said, um, between the the two the two main bloodlines that that are that are seen the most often they're seen the most often are is um either Draco- either draconic or wild magic, and between the two, more often than not, and maybe I'm maybe I'm off base on this. I see dragons more often. I see dragon um, bloodlines more often than I see wild ones. Oh, by far. By far. Most people don't like the chaos that comes with the wild magic. Mm-hmm. Um, they're like, oh, I'll have to roll on another table and stuff could take longer to resolve and also, you know, bad things or can happen. chaos. <laughs> the fact that, like, you're just never going to roll a 20 and then roll on the table. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. is the prerequisite for it. Yeah. Even and normally then, I'm harping on the idea of like, oh, well, this takes too long to resolve. I'm willing to extend that or or uh, subdue that rule, my urge to maintain that rule for design in specific edge cases in which I think the entire table is going to be, you know, perking their ears up and all looking over at you to see what happens next, like rolling for it. For instance, rolling on the wild magic table. Mm-hmm. But in order to get to that point, you have to roll a d20 and get a 20. And that d20 is whether or not you roll that d20 is at your DM's discretion. Yeah. So you and have like five, you have three different awful, awful gates as to what's going to go on. Yeah. And the the big thing there is I don't see most players that I've played with thinking of it even in that fashion it's they see that there's a potential negative uh outcome to choosing wild magic because of the potential negatives that can be rolled on the wild magic table and there's like i don't want to deal with that it's the same reason i see a lot of players reject pulling from a deck of many things because there's a potential negative outcome they definitely don't want it I think the I think the other reason why um, something like Wild Magic isn't isn't as appe- isn't as appealing for a lot of players is the is the se- is the sense of unreliability that it can that it can appear as yeah because um, if some if somebody's ca- if somebody's um, casting somebody's ca- if somebody's casting Fireball I'm just using that because everybody knows what Fireball is. Um, they want they want to have the reassurance that it's gonna that it's going to have its fire its fire and forget set of rules. You throw it, it's a magical it's a magical grenade that burns things. Open and open and shut. 
If you're a wild mage, then there's other stuff that you have to de that you have to potentially deal with. Um, and I'd be perfectly fine with that if 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 um, wild magic had very strong benefits and very strong drawbacks, but it doesn't it doesn't go far enough in either direction. So the the only time I've ever seen wild magic used is when it's been setting enforced. Which is when we come to a to a different sort of question about having sorcerers to begin with. Um, I'm perfectly fine with having with having sorcerers in a in a setting if it if it particularly calls for it. Um, I usually I usually um take I usually take the lore wise I usually take the approach of sorcerers are the t are the type of mages that um with that wizards give the biggest sideways glance to because. That because they have a tendency to do um to overdo things. I didn't necessarily mean that. It was it was they. It goes back to my my mentioning that was going back to our discussions, various discussions at this point over things like implied setting. Yeah, I don't particularly like sorcerers in a in a Vancian game or a Vancian system. I feel, but that's that's a that's a personal taste. I could be persuaded otherwise, depending on the game system and whether or not Vancy and Magic is and its benefits are are retained in spite of the inclusion of a sorcerer, for instance. Yeah. Which that brings that brings us neatly to the to the um source to the approach to sorcery in um in level and level up now one now um one of the things that i did that i did notice is is the is the whole is the whole thing with with um like we mentioned with with sorceress origin but the bit the re the real big takeaway for me when it comes to how, when it comes to how this is work, when it comes to how this is working, is twofold. One is the um, can is the conversion is the flexible casting rule. Um, you know, convert converting sp converting um sorcery points to spell slots and vice versa, which is nice. The other is manifestations. Which I'm, which unless I'm mis unless I'm mistaken, that kind of, that kind of setup is not in the core sorcerer. The abil the ability to essentially force a, a element on spells. I don't believe so. Um, I think it just goes with whatever element the spell may have. Yeah, I, it, as the base sorcerer, no, that's not a part. Flexible casting is a part of the base sorcerer. The manifestations are not. Yeah. And part, and with obviously the first thing that we have is that you is that you can ch you can change the type of damage to your conduit sum damage type. Um. So instead of a fireball, you can have a thunderball. Or or a po or a poison ball or a or a sonic ball or a or an electric ball or an a or an acid ball or an ice ball. We're we're going back to the, to four E sorcerer being the uh, yes to uh, to elements here. Mm -hmm. Um, they and... also have an interesting additional that comes with those manifestations. Yeah. So you're so even bef even before you start learning meta magic, you already have some use for so for um sorcery points, and in fact, nice. which my overall disinterest in these manifestations, notwithstanding, the fact that they actually give you a use for sorcery points before you get meta magic is is tie. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, a, a use other than flexible casting. Yeah, because right. flexible casting is in base. Oh, flexible and... casting is is a way of getting more sorcery points. It's still not. 
Yeah. I guess uh, the fact they could create another spell slot, yeah, it, it does have a use in that in that regard. Um, yeah, but it's it's generally not used that way. Yeah. yeah. And when it comes to latent power, we have we have a we have a introduction of a skill based use for sorcery points, which is also nice. I highlighted two of these in yellow and one of them in blue. And I still, the, I still don't know which of your colors mean what. <laughs> uh, yellow means like this is this is passing, but I'm not interested in it, or or it's like half good and half bad. So uh, it comes out to extreme. a net zero on the main. Right. Unt and then I have blue is like this this pops out to me is something I'm interested in. Okay, so net positive on the matrix. Got right. it. So all eyes and daunting energy, both of them are passing their their mechanical like I'll read out one of them. Daunting energy. You gain an expertise die on intimidation checks. If the creature you are trying to intimidate can cast spells, increase the size of the expertise die by one stage. Your power is more obvious to others who know magic. That's something where like you are increasing this is something I despise in 5th edition and in many games where you any kind of influence on a social check by an ability is just increasing the number. I think it's cowardice on the game designer's part where they will not say, okay, this produces a specific reaction from the people you are attempting to inflict this check on. Right? The, the artifact, you know, you're a Templar... And you attempt to intimidate somebody by accusing them of a crime. And I want to see the ability attached to that. Or if there's an ability attached to that, I want to see it say something like, you inflict fear on all of the onlookers because they fear they might be next. Or if it's successful and invokes suspicion, all the, all the people around you, your audience, so to speak, starts to get into a, a frenzy. They get into the witch hunt mindset. Where the person that you're accusing, Veda, like, yeah, that guy did do that. And and start shouting him down and stuff like, that's an example of a social ability provoking a specific result from the social interaction, which is what most combat abilities do. In so, D20, 5th edition, and in here, they primarily don't do that. They just say, alright, well, we're going to increase the number. So if you succeeded, you succeeded even more. But unsuspecting doesn't do that. But you first. So I, I was actually going to say, if you wanted to change the mechanical hook on this, uh, rather than saying your expertise die becomes bigger, uh, when the intimidation check succeeds, any creature that is magically sensitive uh, is inflicted with fear within, uh, say, a 60-foot radius. Because the energy is radi radiating out from you. I'm, I'm pretty sure you don't have a... Uh, a way to to direct that without turning it into a spell, uh, if we're looking at it from a from a role play point. Uh, oh no, you you could. That's that's going into specifics, but yeah, I'm just I'm just you know spitballing. It. As as an example, like yeah, somebody could, you know, this this makes your audience more afraid, or perhaps the person has. As an example, this person is more willing to acquiesce or won't attack you, or, or I, there's any number of things. Xana, yeah. it's times it's times like these that I miss the intimacy system from ex, from Exalted Two E. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. Uh, the the intimacy system we should we should explain it and not do the whole reference thing. Remember, we yeah. we, we promised him we'd be doing this. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. We did. So let me let me get the exact uh, the exact definition. Um, oh, it's a good good place for it. I re I realize that is I realize that's a very unfair comparison because um, Exalted was trying to have social combat be just be just as detailed as well combat combat. Mm -hmm. Um. But the re the reason I point out that kind of thing is because of the is because of what um what Ash is what Ash is kind of hinting at here, of do of doing something a little more specific than ju than just a than just a di than just a die modifier, um. 
since the, since the whole thing with intimacy is is, be, is in this kind of situation, that would be something that you could directly interface interface with in the way that Ash is kind of going. Um, yeah, the the intimacies to boil it down to the for the sake of almost oversimplifying, uh, intimacies are people, things, nations, groups, places, etc. Uh, that your character is personally invested in in some fashion. These intimacies affect social combat in a way that they can help you, you know, resist mind control, give you ex extra willpower in a in a check, things of that nature. Um, but I, I think I think what Nildra's trying to say here is that intimacies could help make it so that something like daunting energy could have a target. Something that you could specifically affect within an intimacy list. And also because the social combat side of Exalted, uh, as he did say, was, was meant to be just as, as detailed as the actual physical and magical combat of Exalted. Um, the thing with motivations and intimacies was it was a sort of a your mileage may vary thing i saw a lot of people complaining about intimacies and going i'm just gonna pare down social conflicts to opposed roles i'm like and you are missing half the game good job mm -hmm. um it, again... it, it's, it's it's both a role-playing hook and a mechanical hook yeah. for social social combat is is the big thing about intimacies then right. It, in any case, unsuspecting doesn't do the the thing I just complained about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unsuspecting says you get an expertise die. It does ho that whole thing. But when you fail on a deception check against a humanoid, you can use a combination of fast talk and your conduit to make them forget about your misstep, spending one sorcery point to reroll the check. On a success, this is the important part. Their memory skips a beat and fills in the gap with your new story. On a failure, not only do they not believe you, but anyone who can cast spells and observe the exchange, including your target if possible, if applicable, knows that arcane subterfuge was attempted. That's fascinating to me. It's like this is literally a little bit of like, nope, we're just gonna we're just gonna replace what you thought I just said there. Mm -hmm. As a uh, as the old saying goes i reject your reality and substitute my own yep yeah <laughs> now that brings us that brings us to meta magic and that's definitely been expand been expanded um far beyond what it was originally cuz one one side note i do have to make here about the uh, latent power set of powers here um i didn't read them in, in as much detail as we have now before and i'm looking at them and I'm like, oh man, people are going to make even more D and D references about sorcerers with this. All lies is just sensing things with your key, and taunting energy is just radiating your key. Or alternatively, I would reference uh, Shensha novels, but that's just me. Cultivation, my friends, cultivation in all things. Essentially, essentially it is <laughs> if I'm understanding this correctly, Zan, essentially that this is. You're saying that people are going to be using this as an excuse to tr to try and to try and force key based characters as uh, as another a sorcerer. sorcerer. I could see it happening. Uh, I don't see it happening very widespread, but there are there are people out in the boonies of the internet that make these arguments, and I am aware of them, mm -hmm. and I laugh at these people. Look, I'm look. I'm already having to deal with. I'm already having to deal with people who are being pants on head stupid as to try and argue how that how how you could feasibly run JoJo. Don't fucking in say it. What was that, Ash? Don't fucking say it. <laughs> right. It's, it's been three weeks in a row. Don't fucking say it. <laughs> I have to. With Stone Ocean Don't coming. Don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> Do, do do you want to take Muda and should I take Ora? No, <laughs> moving right along. Um, <laughs> let me let when it comes to meta magic. Let me see here. One, I mean, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight meta magic um, options that that you ha that you had that you had access to. 
not obviously not in total. In in fact, you're only going to have um you're going to have four four of them once you hit seventeenth. Um. Whereas in this approach, if you have eleven um, from level three. <laughs> yeah, you've got you've got two you've got two minor and one moderate at the start. You get an, you get another minor at fifth and tenth, and another moderate at tenth. I'm pretty sure you're going to gain another mo another moderate at a higher level as well. And I'm guessing that that once you get above ten, there's also going to be a major. Wouldn't be surprised, but. You These have, are all, all play tests up to 10th, so we don't know for sure. Yeah, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 minor and... Two, 6 three, minor. And Delayed spell, six, distant spell, extended yep. spell, subdual so spell, mm -hmm. subtle spell. Um, no, that's 5 minor. Never mind, you're counting correctly. I'm reading things wrong because my brain is fucked. I wouldn't... <coughs> maybe it's because of the fact that Fancycraft did, did this, but I wouldn't be surprised if at higher levels they put a thing where you could potentially use two meta magics on on one on one spell at I don't, I don't know level 20 or something wasn't that the capstone in base 5e that you could use double meta magic on a single spell or something um no the ca unless on as far as as far as I'm aware you could the capstone was at was that you could gain four sorcery points after a short rest. Oh, okay. I don't know, I haven't read base in a while. <laughs> um the reason the reason I bring the reason I bring up the whole t the whole two in one is um the martial artist class in fantasy craft could do that with tricks. Normally you can only apply one trick to an attack. Um but at a cer at a certain level, I think it was at Either fourteenth or eighteenth, I can't remember off the top of my head. You could apply two, and depending on how, depending on your build, that might not mean much, or it might mean a lot. But Ash, when you were go when you were going through the meta magics, were there any in particular that you highlighted? Only one for which I highlighted in red for made me angry. Which one is that? And that would be Twin Spell. So Twin Spell exists in Base 5e, and everybody will be familiar with the number of arguments and complaints that Twin Spell has produced by people misunderstanding the meaning of target, and then the designers misunderstanding the meaning of target, or changing the definition of target depending on... And, or may, may, loosening the definition of target... And making things generally miserable for everybody, as opposed to taking an obvious solution. Which maybe didn't accord with their original intentions for how this might be used. Twin Spell works basically the same way that 5th edition does, plus clarifying errata. When you cast a spell that targets only one creature and doesn't have a range of self, you could spend a number of sorcery points equal to the spell's level or one for a cantrip, to target a second creature in range with the same spell. To be eligible, a spell must be incapable of targeting more than one creature at the spell's current level. For example, Magic Missile and Scorching Ray are ineligible, but Ray of Frost is. Which I think is, um... Like, they... Okay, you made it work how it's intended to work in 5th edition, and removed all of the ambiguity. But the fights over that ambiguity were over cool combinations or fun 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 uses of twin spell, which weren't really all that harmful. Yeah, or like the very least made I, the, the sorcerer cool. I'm gonna like, I'm gonna be flat out honest. I um I str I struggled to come up with a to come up with a decent reason why why uh, Matt why magic missile should why magic missile and scorching ray should be examples of what would be um in, what would be ineligible. I know I know their reasoning, but with some with something like magic missile, um, da the reason why it doesn't miss is because is is tra is traded off by its very low um damage die. 
and gr granted, some people can do ridiculous builds to the point where you're doing the where you're doing the um, Macross Missile Circus. Lord knows <laughs> I've done it, but those are extremely specialized builds. <laughs> Etano even... Circus with with Magic Missile is always fun. Right here's the thing, though. It's not that like you can come up with game balance reasons for it and stuff like that. It's just cat twin spelling a fireball and coming up with a very specific. If I manage to fit a fireball into the qualifications of doesn't target more than one creature, I should be able to cast that fireball as I'm actually. It allows me to cast spells in the place of an opportunity attack. But the restriction on that is I can only target that creature with the spell. But there's no further restrictions. I can actually, provided I'm not including myself, provided I'm not hitting myself, I can I can hit that guy with a fireball. Um, my, uh, to my, a my, to my ruling as a DM, if you want to know, Ash, mm -hmm. the reason the twinned fireball went off in, in one of my sessions was... When it when it ruled that it has to be uh, something that can only be single target, I ruled that the explosion of fireball is not what is targeting. What is targeting is where you are sending the fireball, and thus, if you target a five foot square on the ground, that is a single target with a DC of five, and uh, there you go, twin it, go ahead, fire away. I want to see what happens when you manage to hurt yourself because you're gonna. The, well, um, that's, I mean, that's there, the problem with it is, is there's one, people. there's one other, there's one other thing that, um, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what wizards really, um, really, really considered. And this is a, this is a case of, of failing to, failing to meet your own, um, your own, pre your own presentation. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to make this about informed setting. I'm, me I'm merely bringing this up in, re in reference to how they, um, present and portray sorcerers. The idea, the idea with sorcerers is that is that they do not cast spells so much as they uncork them, like un like uncorking a shaken up bottle of champagne. Is their is their approach to it? This the whole idea that they are this barely contained conduit of of magical power, which is which is why one of their bloodline options is wild magic. That. I think I think it's safe to say that that's what that's what the intent is, right? Ostensibly, Osten ostensibly the way the way that wizards is trying to is trying to present the sorcerer as as a magic user is this barely is this barely contained font of energy, right? Um. Given that, given that, and the the um, the amount of specificity when it comes to when it comes to twinned meta magic seems to seems to counter seems to counteract that because with a lot of these with a lot of these spells that that could potentially be used in a more abusive manner with 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 twinned first off. It's kind of counteracted by the fact that Twinned is one of the more expensive meta magics, and two, um, it, I, I have, I have no, pr I, I would actually allow somebody to use Twinned magic and then cast Meteor Swarm. <laughs> you, you know, you know, here's here's some here's here's something. <clears throat> Again, about the whole target thing. Mm -hmm. and, and can only target a single target. What do you do about ranged touch attack spells such as Eldritch Blast, where each blast can only target a single target, but you can choose a different target for each blast? Can you... That's, no, that that is specified in the example. This is See, this is the problem. This oh, is the problem. This is actually specified, because Scorching Ray is the same way. Okay, it's ineligible. Yes. Yeah, I never used because Scorching the Ray. Spell, so <laughs> which is why they say must be incapable of targeting more than one creature. So Fireball doesn't make the cut. Magic Missile doesn't make the cut. Scorching Ray doesn't make the cut. Yeah, I'd just wipe out that entire... Uh, I would ignore that entire It's, it's a game design concession, and it is a good concession. 
it is a concession for the mechanics and the design. I I am in total agreement with them that you should probably not, if you're going to be affecting large groups of people with a fireball, there should probably only be one fireball in play until the next time that somebody can cast a fireball. That's that is correct from a game design perspective. Mm -hmm. But but if I am only going to hit one person with a fireball, letting me hit one other person with a fireball and giving me a little bit of a cool factor and a little bit of uniqueness to my class, because I could choose something else. I could just do Ray of Frost, right? It might actually be more effective. But allowing me to do the the cool thing, which is to hit both of these people, which are not in the same radius of fireball, with two fireballs, because I've twin spent, spelled them, and they've manifested the other... What would my version of the restrictions for twin spell, that would be cool, and it wouldn't be game-breaking. And that's what why I highlighted this in red, because, no, a twin spelling meteor swarm would not be okay from a game design perspective. It, it wouldn't be... I'm not sure it would even be that cool. But from a from a design perspective, editing this so that, like, okay, provided you can meet these qualifications, which they're trying to do anyway, mm -hmm. which means that more, ex more exceptions are going to come up and more confusion is going to come up from it, as it always does, because they, like, well, we'll just keep rewording this until people understand that they can only do this in the way that we want to until we've gone through every single spell in the book and all the splat books until people understand which ones they could use it for and which ones they can't because we're using ambiguous wording. No. Just set up the general qualification of the spell only t affects one creature. Mm -hmm. And only affects this other creature. And then you're good to go. And we know that works because there's a separate feat, as I've already mentioned, there's a separate thing in the base game that already works that way and doesn't cause these problems. Yeah. Now, I don't know why they won't take the obvious solution. They uh, are insistent on taking this stupid solution and causing new problems for themselves. That's why I highlighted it in red. Would you say it's a case of um, not understanding future-proofing? Uh, yes. Yes, this is this is an attempt at future-proofing, and they're like, no. The problem is the ambiguous wording. You included the ambiguous wording and attempted to unambiguity it. Mm -hmm. Ambiguize. Unambiguize. No, Dis like disambiguate. Word. No. no. Word you're looking for. I prefer unambiguize. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a funnier... No. Uh, yeah, they, the, that's basically what they're trying to do. It's like, okay, they are attempting to future-proof the players. What they need to do is they need to future proof the designers. I just I just look or more I importantly, just, future proof the GMs. I just look at this and I'm, and the thing that the thing that I'm reminded of, especially especially given um recent events, is how is um my experiences with Overwatch. And I know that may seem kind of left field, but I'm but I'm going somewhere with this. I hope they, so because I'm already on the snooze train at this point. <laughs> they um they were very very Blizzard was very very zealous about patching any kind of tech that was discovered by the player base. I distinctly remember videos popping up all over the place of a um of a bunt of a hopping exploit that people were able to use to cover more ground playing as Mercy, and is so and within less than a week of those videos starting to make traction, that thing had already gotten patched out. That reminds me of a uh, of Square Enix being way too zealous with patching exploits for absolute virtue. Mm -hmm. Um, it's one. It's one of those. Th it's one of those things where these these kind of things are these kind of things and these kind of accidental exploits are go are going to come up, and tr and trying to trying to stamp out every single one of them, is sword fighting a fart. Like you're what? you're you're just get, you're just going you're you're putting you're just gonna be putting in more and more effort for something that. Isn't going to get is going to pay off enough. 
and that's wh that's why with these these smart designers, when these kind of things crop up, they'll tend to they'll tend to leave it in. Um, I often come to the whole BXR thing that never got patched out. Um, and when it when it comes, but I am curious what your guys' take on this whole idea of separating meta magic into degrees instead of it being a unified list. Um, I don't really have a an opinion one way or the other on it. The I guess by separating it into those degrees, it gives people an understanding of how much of a resource they're going to have to commit for the meta magic they want at a glance. But that that's really all I see here is that it's just a a, a convenient way of saying. Hey, this thing costs more resources, so you can only do it so often. I could see it as a means to try and encourage diversification of um, meta magic. I I can give an explanation for it, which is just you take unused, commonly unused meta magics, and you put them at the lower level bracket and say you must pick something from the lower level bracket, and therefore it gets some use. Mm -hmm. And then all the ones that you guys, that we know you guys are going to take at higher levels, we're going to put them in the separate bracket so that you have two separate resource pools and we make sure that you have a chance of using one of the ones that you otherwise wouldn't. Yeah, Diversification is probably a good word for it, actually. Mm -hmm. the, re the reason why I say that is because with that unified list, well, the, th the thing I can easily see happening is a lot of people end up picking the same... Um, smaller the same smaller pool of yeah. met of meta magic I, I mean we all know that that that's why they put it in mm -hmm. we, we all know that, that it's going to be twin spell empowered spell heightened whatever and and yeah yeah now then explore as... exploration acts mm -hmm. are cool we yeah. should go over those so I will. I will admit, with some with some of them, I may end up get. I may end up getting them just for the name. One of them being Hot Air. Of course, you would. <laughs> uh, it, mine would be Weird Insight, though, because I'm weird and I have insight into a lot of weird, trivial shit. Yeah. Um, if you're Hot Air, I'm Weird Insight. There we go. <laughs> yeah. But the. The idea, the idea, uh, the idea of the f of um, I don't I don't know why, but I keep, when I think when I think of hot when I think of hot air, I keep thinking of the pee balloon from Mario World and the sorcerer falling. Oh, uh, got nothing. Especially, um, and of course of. I, of these, like I um, I could see magnetic step getting you getting used fairly frequently. Because for for all for all intents, it's a slightly weak it's a slightly weaker version of spider climb. Uh, not not that misses a little bit. No, it's so magnetic step. For those who don't know, is you can move. I hope these uh, are in some way on the on the video, but you can move along vertical surfaces at half your speed without needing to make an ability check. If you end your turn on such a surface, you immediately fall unless you have some other way to support yourself. It's like uh, monks. Uh, monks actually get a, a version of this at some point. But no, it's I mean it's cool. Like the hot air is neat. Strange traces was another one where, where I I noticed it and kind of glanced over it. But it, it's okay. It's you could spend one sorcery point. This is one of those things where unfortunately I don't know if these people understand. I hope they put out an exploration package to help explain what their exploration system is. Because if it's things like spend spend rations to not starve to death. I'm be really disappointed because otherwise, uh, these are not going to these feature some of these features that they include in exploration acts need an exploration system, not just the presence of these in the game. Like you did something, and now somebody is going to you rolled on a table, or you pulled a card, or some kind of consequence was invoked 
by something you did or something you had the misfortune of being inflicted with and now somebody is coming after you and that's where this comes in handy. In if it doesn't happen enough, this just won't come really... Yeah. It's not going to get selected. For for the purposes of this, I I have I've looked through a fair few of the documents that we've yet, that we've yet to go over, and they ha they haven't re they haven't really um dedicated one, dedicated one to a to a um to a to a to a exploration system. So until uh, until I hear otherwise, assume that there isn't. If uh, if I find out down the line that that's that that's something that they have planned, then I will eat crow that day. Um, I mean, it's it's got to be something that planned. I can't I can't see them making this stuff without the idea that it might fit into a wider system. But it's I I on a case, I trust these designers by and large. In spite of my earlier rant, you can hear my earlier rants and earlier videos about why I actually do trust these designers, in spite mm -hmm. of the twin spell thing. Yeah, but I don't know if, if this is this is a the exploration thing. It's more fodder for third party content creators. Though I don't know what the market is going to be for third party content creators for third party content. Uh, probably not that great. Uh, and occasionally just coming up with exploration acts that have more of an impact in the game in a more typical fashion or have a greater frequency of an impact on the game like Magnetic Step or Hot Air. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, I want, I want to shift into um, Arcane Refinement. Um, obviously, we've got... We've We've got th we've got three options within these, and between and between the th between the three of them, um, I fe I feel that the I feel that the one that may that possibly is going to get used the least is patient aptitude. Patient aptitude. Where is that? Um. That's going to be on page seven. It goes, you may pick a number of spells with the ritual tag equal to your charisma modifier. These spells need not be from the sorcerer spell list, but must be of a level for which you have spell slots. You can cast these spells as rituals, though you don't gain the ability to cast them normally with slots, nor do they count toward your spells known. If you increase your charisma modifier, the number of ritual spells you know also increases. Each time you gain a level, you can replace one of these ritual spells with another. Yeah, I don't see that getting picked too much because if you wanted ritual spells, you'd just go with a different caster. Mm -hmm. I feel like this. I feel like this kind of thing is thro is throwing a bone for people who want to use rituals and be sorcerers. But feels a bit stopgap. Yeah, prodigious innovator. I can see that getting a fair amount of use because cantrips are cantrips are um fa are fairly useful in five e. And getting three more of them is is certainly not something I'm gonna I'm gonna scoff at. Cantrips are fairly useful, is understatement. Mm -hmm. um, deep conduit, I'd say that's somewhere. In, I'd say that's somewhere in the middle. Um, you are, spe or rather, it's have. Actually, I'm not. Actually, the more I look at it, the, I'm still. I'm still not sure because it gets it gets better the longer you look at it. You should read it. Yeah, it says when you finish a short rest, you can expend a number of hit dice up to your charisma modifier to regain some of your magic essence. For each hit dice expended in this way, you take one d6 damage and regain two sorcery points. So you take some damage to get more sorcery points. Now the question is, since it since it uses the verbiage regain, does it only mean up to your sorcery point maximum? I would interpret that to be your maximum. Yeah. Which means it wouldn't really be useful to uh to use unless you were super low on sorcery points to begin with. 
Well, give, given the fluff for talking about reaching beyond your limits, which um, is not a, not helping the DBZ sorcerer co connection that people make. <laughs> I've got it stuck in your head now, Monk. Good job. I hate you. <laughs> um, okay, I see. I see where you're coming from, Ash. I do think that the whole taking damage to get sorcerer points back is gonna make some people hesitant, given that um. Sorcerers aren't as squishy as they used to be, but they are. They are lean. They do lean on the squishy end of the of the spectrum. Still have the lowest hit die, don't they? Mm, they've got a D six for a hit die. Yeah, but I don't. Does anything have a yeah. D four anymore? Nothing has a D four now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so lowest hit die. Um. Now, what... I remember when sorcerers had a D4. Fighting a squirrel was a bad idea. Yeah, especially especially if you were that one guy who got, who really pissed off the dice gods and ended up roll ended up first level rolling a rolling one D4 with a con of ten. Cha. <laughs> so you have only one hit point. Um. Now with with seventh level we have ra we have rapturous presence and we and once again we have three options there. Um, I'd say were any of the were between the three of them larger than life nobody's fool and otherworldly were did were any of those highlighted for you, Ash? Larger than life was highlighted in yellow. This was this was another little bit of a social thing where, mm -hmm. you know, because again we're discussing social abilities that don't really do anything, except make it bigger or make it smaller. Uh, nobody's fool, on the other hand, was, yeah, because I'm not I'm not going to go over the previous one. It's just mm -hmm. improved intimidation checks. Yeah. Nobody's fool, on the other hand, was people find it difficult to lie to you or to conceal their motives in your presence. You add your charisma modifier to insight checks. In addition, you can spend one... This is the interesting part. You could spend one sorcery point as an action to project an aura of honesty. For the next ten minutes, creatures within ten feet of you have disadvantage on deception checks made to lie or conceal the truth. When a creature... This is the really interesting part. <laughs> When it, it's, it took a long time, I'd be fine if it was only this last part, this next sentence I'm going to say. When a creature in this aura fails a deception check, it accidentally blurts out something it didn't mean to while attempting to spin its lie. That is beautiful. And this is, is what I mean by forcing social interactions. The DM does not have to... This is great, because sometimes you get DMs who are like... They get stuck into a specific NPC like Jared Leto's Joker or um, Grog. So what Jeez. you're saying is that by casting a sorcerer's version of Zone of Truth, because that's what it is, you turn targets that fail to lie to you into Sweet Anita. Got it. Sweet Anita is a YouTuber and streamer with Tourette's very extreme tics, and one of the, one of her tics is blurting out things that she's thinking at the time. Oh, I remember. I, I I've seen her. I think. Yeah, she's the one who who does a lot of popping uh, when she's talking because her tics are her Tourette's is rather a, a rather extreme case. Yeah. But I figure it's it's topical to to reference mm -hmm. because Sweet Anita is actually pretty fun to watch. Um. I didn't. I didn't mind. Uh, I didn't. The only pro. The only um problem that I have with with um otherworldly is the same problem I have with any with any sort of favored type kind of kind of approach. You're um you're putting a lot. You're putting a little bit too much faith in the DM to actually actually put in monsters where you're going to be using that kind of thing. This isn't. At, but be, because it's three creatures instead of one, it's not. As bad as as a favorite enemy, but um, it it but it is it is still it is still enough to make me tilt my head. But otherworldling, yeah, um, it goes select three creature types aber at between aberration, celestial, dragon, elemental, fey, fiend, or undead. 
You have advantage on charisma checks to make a first impression on a creature of one of your chosen types. And if you do not share a common language, you can still communicate some simple concepts such as friendly, help, and run. In addition, by spending two sorcery points and one minute in meditation, you can change your creature type to one of those you've chosen. This transformation lasts for one hour and cannot be reversed early. I actually like this one quite a bit. I like it. That's why they, the, that last part there is why it's totally fine for it to be only one creature type. Um, to, yeah. The, um, the, the latter half of the, the latter half of this setup, I, do, I don't mind. It's the, fo it's the former that, ha that has me, t that has me, um, tilting, um, because because it's get, it's going to be a case where some where some parts aren't can, aren't, aren't going to get used as much depending on what sort of um cre what sort of creature list the DM is working with. However, for all intents right, and purposes, but that's, this that's is fine. Yeah, if you, if they give that, if you have enough, it becomes a problem when you're looking at somebody who only has features that apply to this specific situation. I th I think what saves something like otherworldly is that you're going to have three types that you that you'll have access to. And one of them out of all of the types named is always useful. Dr being able to turn yourself into draconic origin or otherwise uh, have a charisma check with draconics is uh always useful. Uh, you, especially if you, you know, use yourself to change yourself to the dragon creature type, um, you can then make the argument very convincingly. In fact, I would, I would likely give some sort of bonus or, or some sort of uh, advantage on a social role to convince people that you are a dragon currently polymorphed into human shape. That's where, like, even if this was only one creature type, this would be again, this would be useful. Yes, it's a, it's a social. It's primarily social, um, and making yourself look undead, or making yourself look like a, make yourself look like a dragon. I think that's a fantastic example. It's like oh, I have scales and claws. Well, what do you think about me now? Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, it's pretty I'd, good like to, I'd like to open the full. I'd like to open the um, full in the full in the full version of this. Of this setup, they ha they put a um, text box giving sam giving sample um, appearance traits for e for each of the types, like what what um what you might go what you might go with with your with your appearance change if you pick aberration, what you might go with if you pick um, elemental, if you pick if you pick undead, and so on. Some of it is pro some of it is probably obvious, but it's I think it's a I think it's a good thing to have to give people the nudge. Um, obvious, the obvious one for a dragon is going to be the draconic eyes, the claws, and the scales. Mm -hmm. um, aber with aberration, um, that can go so many different ways, um, up to does and that, including tentacles. Doesn't aberration also include oozes and slimes? No, oozes are uh, oozes are their own creature type, albeit uncommon. Okay. So this isn't the full list uh, of of all the creature types, which is which is fine. Yeah. It is called otherworldly after all. Uh, elemental elemental is a is a good one. Just turn yourself into fire. Make you make yourself look like a fire ganasi. Yeah. Um <laughs> I can catch everything on fire now. Oh god, you've made the sorcerer more powerful. What are you doing? <laughs> um <laughs> I could I could see I could see myself being a complete asshole with uh with the fiend version of this and turn myself into Tim Curry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if a if a young Tom Cruise ever shows up, you're done for. Right. What was I supposed <laughs> to go with, Al Pacino? Yeah, but then if a young if a young Keanu Reeves shows up, you're done for. <laughs> Remember that the devil always loses in those movies. Hey, there's a long list that you could uh, develop along that line of thought, but I'd like to continue a different line of thought that Zan brought up. Actually, the idea that you know, making yourself, changing, transforming yourself along, for instance, 
Elemental lines would make you look like a fire ganasi. This is interesting to me because when it comes to something I'm sure we're going to discuss once we come to the subclass hour is <laughs> how these various creature type like the fact the idea that you that some of these subclasses are very clearly tied to other creature types or other origins which are shared with these creature types this is something of a I, I normally don't like flavor text but this is some pretty cool flavor text that you could take advantage of is I'm a draconic sorcerer well I select otherworldly and one of the things that I select is the, dra the dragon type or I'm a psionic sorcerer in spite of my misgivings about psionics and mixing them with casters I choose the aberration type Give yourself all of the tentacles because you've got an obsession with Japan. The I, let's not do that. <laughs> the, thing, the thing that I the thing that I like about 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 some of the, about some of the um, social advantages that they have is that, and I get the feeling this this would go even more and more extreme at um, at higher levels. Is that it is very uh, it is very obvious that you are it's very obvious more and more as you level up that you are a sorcerer. Yeah. I didn't think of that about that. That's kind that's kind of that's kind of why that's kind of why I brought up the whole thing of your your um if you're if you're playing in my in my view, if someone is playing a sorcerer, they are not playing it they're not playing it to be subtle. I realize the irony of me saying that when one of the meta magic um, abilities is subtle spell, but the but the <laughs> point is is that every much in the same way that everybody knows when a psyker is around in 40k, everybody should know when a sorcerer is around, even people who don't use magic. Mm -hmm. It's just like how everybody knows when a bard is around, but that's also because of all of the sex sounds. <laughs> But do you remember? <laughs> the, early, do you remember earlier when I when I talked about um, how the elemental question for 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 fourth edition sorcerers was yes? Well, we kind of we kind of get a bit of that with evolving manifestations, since you can either use the better version of the manifestation you got at second level, or get another get another uh, manifestation. All of these flavors, and you not only chose salty, you chose sweet. So, if if so, that potentially means that somebody could that somebody could have that fireball be um be Cidic be fire. I was I was thinking I was thinking um freezer burn. <laughs> uh, fire ice. Yes. Or, or 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 better better yet, frozen lightning. Oh, so oh, so what New Jersey goes through every year? Huh. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, we do. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, we could go with fire lightning, which is what Texas just went through today. Oh, that's so, right. Yeah, one of my buddies in Texas was like, "Yeah, the storms raging outside." It was so nice. I love thunderstorms. Don't get me wrong. Thunderstorms are lovely. If there's exactly. if there's an underlying, and they hurt as a. Coincidentally, they are the only interesting thing in these meta magic, in these manifestation lists, as far as I'm concerned. Hurricane. But not everything has to be interesting. <laughs> I get it. Some of these are just we recycle a little bit of the damage from the spell, and that's it's okay for some things to be fought. You know, like that, so long as I have my cool stuff. <laughs> that's the um, most important thing here, Ash. That we give you cool things. Yeah, exactly. The the evolving one, as far as the evolving ones, um. Blit, um, evolving Blizzard it is essentially the old Thorns effect from Diablo. Um, Caustic. Caustic might be nice if somebody wants to go for a little bit more of a controller thing. Um, hurric hurricane. Well, you you br you bring ca you bring Kansas to the setting. <laughs> um, Every time I hear the word hurricane, the only thing I can think of is puns, puns, and more puns. But that's due to a uh... Hurricane -ger. Yeah. Um in in Inferno um 
you you end up get, you end up getting for, you end up adding fire to your fire. <laughs> so you can it's, burn while you burn. Yeah. To we reference a very like old meme. Yeah, you <laughs> you with evolving inferno from the archives. You spend what you spend one sorcery point to store some of the energy at as a flame you hold in one hand, you can then use an action to throw this flame, making a ranged spell attack against the target you can see within 30 feet. On a hit, the creature takes 1d6 fire damage per the level of the spell cast to trigger this effect. The flame lasts for a minute or until it's thrown. Ooh. You could twin that. That's, what, it I, that's target. what I was well, thinking. <laughs> I wonder if you could twin that because it, it, it does only target one thing, but it's Technically not a spell, so I don't know. Huh. No, it's it Wait, says so range what's spell the attack. Of the spell? Oh let's, yeah. Let's go over this. Where is it? Um, Where's the text? It's on, page eight? Yeah, it's on page eight. And it says it's a ranged spell attack, so We're evolving Inferno. Inferno. Mm -hmm. Uh it's a ranged spell attack, but that doesn't make it a spell, because ranged spell attack is you see this often when it comes to when we're developing like NPC stop stat blocks or or monster stat blocks in general. If you want to include something that like this is not a ranged spell, this is not a weapon attack. Uh, it's something magical, so we list it as being a uh, we list it as a spell attack. And the reason we list it as a spell attack is so that features which reduce, penalize, or defend otherwise defend against weapon attacks don't interact with it. But the reverse isn't necessarily true. There aren't a whole lot of things that interact with spell attacks from enemy creatures. So when it specifies spell, it usually means spell, not anything that's covered under... Spell attack is just another word for weapon. This is another one of these lexical ambiguities that unfortunately exists in the game. Yep. Hang on a sec. Um, let's see, then... Evolving... Evolving Venom. Um, it's it's more it's it's more poison. Like a um, evolving and evolving and the thing with a lot of the evolving manifestations is that for all intents and purposes, the the they're mostly just more of what you of what you got before. Um, Inferno is the one that really stuck that really stuck out to me because that's a case of. Managing to sneak in multicasting without actually multicasting. Um, like like like, like, yeah. like I was just saying to Asha, I would rule it can be twinned just because mm -hmm. at my tables, rule of cool is is rule of the day. <laughs> Alternatively, rule of close enough. Yeah, <laughs> that 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 tr that too. I've done that. I've been like, eh, close enough for government work, and then uh, and then <laughs> rule that a thing can work. Yeah. Um. Although, two, evolving venom gives um two d six poison damage, which I'd say is, fa I'd say is a um. I'd say it's just fit. Say it's just um fair. But I'm. I I really wish poison did more than just a dot. Because poisons used to actually be somewhat useful. Like there are there are better better uh, better ways of doing continuous damage than just something that can again be undone by a medicine check. This is something that we've discussed in previous uh, previous valleys when we when specifically fighter and some of the maneuvers that you know applied wounding damage and such. If the poison did more than just oh you're taking poison damage, I would, I would like it. <laughs> um, with some, some of these do seem to um, do seem do seem to favor certain play styles. Like evolving Blizzard, I could see that getting used for casters who prefer getting in close range. Like they like if they want to be a little um, tanky. Of course, mm. the, I realize the contradictoriness of of a caster wanting to be tanky, but it, but stranger things have happened. Um, Spell swords are a thing. Yeah, get 
we all we all know about the glory of Gish. Um, exactly. The beautiful, the wonderful glory. Actually, that's one thing I guess I should, huh? There's not only is there a lot of I need to be a little bit more fair to the evolving manifestation, I guess, uh, for the especially in anticipation of the subclass hour. Um, I'll start with the other thing, which is it's great multiclassing fodder, but uh, these are great mechanical hooks for subclasses, and they can't be too mechanically intense. For for the for the base class feature, if you want to iterate on it with a subclass feature, and they're probably at r the right degree of complexity for that. I I also get the feeling there's go there's there's going to be a th at um higher levels there's going to be either a third tier of evolving manifestation or the option to get another um conduit feature or both. Like I could see, I could see, I could see. At say, um, at say, um, eighteenth level, you can get, you can get either a thir a third tier of manifestation or get or get another um, conduit. Um, Triple conduit power. Make yourself a hurricane of ice and fire. Yeah. At least that that's the approach. That's the approach I'd I'd probably go with, and I. I wouldn't be surprised if in the full book there is a feature to give yourself a nut to give yourself another fe another um conduit feature to have four conduits one with a feet three with uh three with the class features yes because I because I there is a small part of me that wants somebody to do to do fu to do um fire blizzard lightning and th lightning and thunder to be the closest thing that the, the closest thing in this thing that we have to somebody being the avatar Lightning and thunder are both on hurricane, so you get both when you get that conduit. Uh, in that case, in that case, in that, in that case, let's say they have um, fire, cold, lightning, lightning or thunder, and um, acid. I was gonna say <laughs> acid simply because you could say that this is the result of acid rain. Yeah, <laughs> a, a a acid hurricane. Think about think about that and try to sleep tonight. Notice we're all avoiding. Well, notice that Monk and I are avoiding poison because it's just kind of underwhelming. Yeah. It... But that that of course brings us to the sub. Actually, bef before we get to subclass, I do want to tackle um, the the variants when it comes to when it, com when it comes to um. The sorcerer, because there there was a there were a set of class feature variants that was brought up in in, in a um edition of Unearthed Arcana, um, and I'm curious if you think if you think some of these are some of these are being uh, are being um un, are being um in this are being in the same niche that we're that we're seeing within. The level up um, sorcerer. The first one, of course, is um, spell versatility. Um, whenever you finish a long rest, you can replace one spell from the spell from the spell casting feature with an, with another spell from the sorcerer spell list. I think what I'm, I think what I'm asking is in this case is the um. The ver the variant um, sorcerer. Do you think do you think that would be compatible with um, the level up version? Yes. Um. <laughs> oh, and it, oh, talk talk about lousy timing because. At first, it's lousy timing. Yeah, at first, le at first level, there's spell versatility. Then at second level, there's um, font of magic, which it which gain which just gives more options for spending sorcery points. Um. Then and, and so this variant is all about. I'm not familiar with the variants. I didn't read on Earth Arcana much. Yeah, um, and mo a, f a couple more um, meta magic options. The 
the sorceress versatility at fourth at fourth level in um Ta in Tasha's cauldron which when you re when whenever you gain ASI you could e you could either replace one of your one of your meta magic options or replace a cantrip um i think given 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 how ASI can also provide feats i feel like that's not in something like sorceress versatility is not is a little bit one-sided of a trade in my opinion mm -hmm. um something like magical guidance and uh, that i think that i think some of the social features already already um co already cover that kind of thing with a better with a better sense of role playing cuz all that it, all that magical guidance is is spend one sorcery point to do a do over yeah um for they had also put there was also um, proficiency versatility, which they put in at eighth, twelfth, and sixteenth and nineteenth, um, where you can also replace one of your skill proficiencies with it, with one offered by your class at first level. Um, but again, this whole this whole alt these kind of alternatives to ASI, I don't think they're a good enough trade. Then again, I have. Uh, I've already made clear that I have problems with the whole ASI or feet thing. Yeah. Um, I am... Um, I'm not sure how well the variants would interact with the level up project either, so... The only... the Really, the only... Um, the only the only one I see, I see having some interesting interaction is... Um, is Font of Magic. Because as far as as far as the meta magic options, those being seeking spell and um tra and transmuted spell, um seeking spell is ju is just a um is just a do is once again a do over and do overs aren't that interesting to me and transmuted spell, um changing da changing damage type that's ar that's already co that's already kind of covered by conduit. And covered more interestingly, as we've made clear with some of the crazy things we were talking about. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it, you were you weren't here when I mentioned this, but um, some but some of the some of the versatility um fe features when it came to when it came to um optional features that and that one was in Tasha, um. It's not. I don't think it's enough of it. I don't think it's a even enough of a trade. Trade trading in a trading in ASI to to um replace one of your cantrips, or replace one of your meta magics. Yeah, those were those were like come on, come on guys, um, come on, let's see. At hi at higher levels, they brought in um in the class feature variants for Unearthed Arcana, they tooled around with the idea of proficiency versatility where you'd trade your ASI for one of the skill proficiencies at first level but at the level that you'd be doing proficiency versatility um it's a it's a little it's too little too late to to have to have cold to have cold feet about what cla what um skills you're investing in well even i mean there's a feat called skilled it just does that but better <laughs> Yeah, because it gives you three of them, and it's not limited to the class. <laughs> Why did they put that in? Yeah, I don't. Th I um, as far as far as as far as variants, the um, the variance the variance from Tasha is sl actually the um, the only the only um, there's only a couple variants that I can I can see. Being uh, being all that com being all that compatible or all that interesting alongside the level up sorcerer, um, one of them is spell versatility. Um, so, you know, being a being able to swap being able to swap around spells in your spell list at, during long during um long rest that's that's going to have its uses. And um. 
and font and um, font of magic, which, or rather, or rather, some some more options when it comes to font of magic, those being empowering re empowering reserves, imbuing touch, and sorcerous fortitude. Um, of those, I could I could see I can all I can easily see um. Imbuing tu imbuing touch to have to have the most u to have the most use, since you're ba you're basically t you're basically turning um the few weapons that you have into ma into magic weapons for a brief amount of time um which can ha which of course can have its uses um but sorceress fortitude only giving only giving um d4 thps that's not that's not really all that's not really all that all that useful because nobody likes rolling d4s. I like hurting people's feet with. I I just wanted to let that hang in the air a little bit longer before I came in with it. But <laughs> yeah, the using I mean using a die because it's an underused die. It's like come on, come on, guys, come on, guys. You, you know, can ban it. I'm not the D4 ha the D4 has its use, but spending sorcery points to get D spending a sorcery point to get a D4 hit, um amount of temporary hit points. I fe I feel that I feel that's something that would only really be useful at very low levels. Once you once you get into the teens, that's going to be utterly useless. Because you're going to you're going to have a ridiculous amount of hit dice at that point. Yeah. Though I guess maybe <laughs> funnily enough, given given that one feature we went over earlier, which gives you additional sorcery points by uh getting rid of hit dice. <laughs> um a little bit of a you get a little bit of a feedback. I'm not sure where I'm going there, but like maybe maybe that would be useful. In this iteration of the game, this level up iteration of the game, but get, but I think I think it's high, I think it's high time we stop pussyfooting around and get and get to the subclasses. So as always, the approach is how how compatible or incompatible these would these would be with um, the level up version of the sor of the sorcerer compared compared to the um, vanilla. So. I'll start off at I'll start off with one that was introduced through Tasha, and that is Aberrant Mind. I think this is actually going to be a good thumbs up. I think this is actually going to be a good fit, as I've explained in other places. I think that the designers the des these designers could tackle psionics in maybe not the fashion that I want them to, but in a mechanically competent fashion. You know? Um so next is Clockwork Soul also from Tasha and he is he is muted <laughs> Sorry about that I <laughs> pressed the wrong button My goodness so the Clockwork Soul I'm going to give this one a thumbs down dumb concept um I don't know why it made it in there, I think it's, it's, this is one of those things where if they're designing it for level up, they're probably going to be doing it whole cloth uh, on the, or on the backs of their own creativity. Maybe there's a little bit of mechanical fodder they could use in there, but I was just like, eh. Thumbs down. Thumbs down. Yeah, when I, when I look at Clockwork Soul, the only thing I can see is really being useful is is the, is its um benefit at level 18 um but a, but a lot of it is a lot of it is just tr is just trying to clockwork soul is a giant no you button <laughs> that's that's the best way for me to look at it and honestly it's not going to take it honestly when it's it's something that wouldn't it wouldn't be interesting enough 
especially get especially given the especially given the um approaches with conduit that um the sorcerer has I mean Zan and I going back to our old uh, stomping grounds are the classic classic bottomless bottomless well <laughs> uh, we we have our own taste when it comes to magical expressions of order true that's very amber now i've now i've done the reference thing um <laughs> Now he's done the reference thing. Oh no! <laughs> and that's all I can think. Also, also, um, <laughs> frank, frankly speaking, some something like Bastion of Law shouldn't that belong to a paladin, not a um sorcerer? <laughs> um, what are you talking about? Palerers are a thing, as 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 are sorcerdens. Fuck off. Thought monks didn't like the paladins being ultimate expressions of order. Hmm. Mm-hmm. 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 I thought somebody didn't want the morality check. I'm mostly pointing out that Bastion of Law is basically the Final Fantasy Paladin cover. No. 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 Especially not with what happened to Paladin uh, in... in Shadowbringers, but we'll not talk about that because that's an entirely different rabbit hole. I wasn't even going with Shadowbringers. I was going with Cecil. Cecil Harvey can uh, can be fun. Especially when he goes back to level 1. That's always fun. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, game. Um, I definitely needed a level 1 main party character. Yep. Um, Divine... Next is Divine Soul, which is basically um, the reincarnation of 3rd Edition's favorite soul, although not as broken. A thumbs up in this instance. There's a number of, there's a number of different uh, hooks I could move into here. Uh, that's an opportunity for unique metamagic. It's an opportunity for unique latent powers and the various social skills that have been attached to the Sorcerer, and a way in which they could you know, make these, bring them less in the in the vein of, make social skills less in the vein of, we increase this number and make it higher, and more in the vein of, we provoke specific results. I understand them being a little less, or being more hesitant to do that in the base class, but given how what they've done so far, they will have no excuse to not do some more specific and provoke specific results in social situations with the abilities when it comes to the subclasses. And... A celestial sourced sorcerer, source sorcerer. That's an interesting phrase. Would be perfect for that. It'd be perfect for that. It, it, it's it's full chock full of opportunities. Big thumbs up. All right. And obviously, there's an intersection with otherworldly. We went over that earlier. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, what is it? The manifestations. Uh, perfect opportunity for radiant damage to make its appearance. Yeah. Um, Chock full of mechanical hooks. I'm pretty sure the clerics will be salty, but um, fuck it. <laughs> Who um, cares about those evangelical bastards? Look the the only the only cleric that I care of is the one from Dead Alive. <laughs> uh. But next is shadow magic. Of the Shadow Sorcerer? Yeah. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Thumbs up for all, basically all the same reasons I explained earlier. The idea that, you know, there was this very funny list of quirks that was included with the original Shadow Sorcerer. I think they made it into, or at least some of them made it into the official version. But things like... If you were a shadow sorcerer, you were so f suffused with necrotic energy because they were leaning into the more necrotic element rather than the illusory element mm -hmm. of the shadow fell, as has been typical for the past for the past few editions of the game. Uh, going more towards a, a nether realm rather than being the the realm of of again going to Zalazny's amber, mm -hmm. but. 
Um, there was this funny quirk like your heart beats once per minute. This fact sometimes surprises you, which I, I could not contain myself when I read that line. I couldn't believe it was in the document from Watsi. Uh, it's basically, I again, thumbs up for basically all the same reasons as the Divine Soul Sorcerer. With manifestations, you could include necrotic. Uh, you could directly port over one of the abilities, which is that, you know, one of the Shadow Sorcerer abilities is creating the darkness spell, but you can see through it, and you only have to spend a sorcery point in order to do it. That fits perfectly in with either a manifestation or an evolving manifestation. And you don't even have to make it a concentration spell to begin with. Um, and, yeah. So, next is Storm Sorcery. Mm hmm. Thumbs, again, thumbs up. Only because... And Storm Sorcerer had some annoying features in it. I did DM for a Storm Sorcerer, and I tried to make them as cool as possible. Mm -hmm. So I frequently took the things that annoyed me most as a DM and just made them cooler or more effective. Because also, oftentimes, the Storm Sorcerer would include these things that would be like, uh, deal half of your level in lightning damage to creatures within 10 feet. It's like, oh, I'm so glad that I get to take all these creatures who all have 100 hit points each, and I now get to stop the game so I can look down and find those specific six stat blocks and turn them into, and make sure that I mark down minus three. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was so annoying to me. But the Storm Sorcerer actually has some of its abilities have already made it into this document when it comes to the manifestations. So, if there's a Storm Sorcerer that comes as a result of the level up playtest, it's going to iterate on those abilities, which have already been ported from its source material. This excites me quite a bit. I'm very excited. You can probably tell that this is genuine. I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. I love storm magic. I include it. It's a big part of my own world, my own settings lore, and it, uh, yeah, big thumbs up. Yeah, big thumbs up. Now I can, I can. Oh, and the social, the social capacity for like, hey, I, I start. Actually, no, I have to, I have to continue gushing over this. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll be over in a moment. First, the social capacity of generating a storm around you would be incredible. A thunderclap, you accuse somebody of something and a thunderclap sounds at your backside. <sighs> it sends chills down my spine. And then, the exploration axe. That's going to be perfect for a storm sorcerer. They're, they're no, nothing better for a, stor for a sorcerer than to be a storm sorcerer and go through the exploration axe and have a, your own unique... Um, hook on either the existing knacks or a specific knack that you got for being there, like magnetic step with the storm sorcerer. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't have to abide by the surface issue anymore. Yep. Um, Maybe you can end your turn on a vertical surface and just walk up the side of a building, lightning at your feet. Mm -hmm. Lightning your feet! And Wait, what? Now... <laughs> Quick, quick question for quick question for this next one because this one is a this one is semi official. But did you did you ever read the um, plane shift article, specifically the one for Kaladesh? I <sighs> not to any degree that I can recall them. Um, they did put one sorceress origin in that specifically for fire elementalism. Um, which is all which is all about bur all about burning thing. It <laughs> you turn you turn into Trogdor. Don't yeah. worry about it. Um its first feature m means that all fire spells you cast technically become area spells as enemies within 10 feet of you take some fire damage when you cast a fire spell. Um then get then giving fire resistance and the ability to negate fire resistance when you're flinging fire. Um, and get and giving yourself fire, th giving yourself fire thorns, and at the top, at the highest tier, taking that fire resistance into fire immunity, and making it so that fire immune targets only count as having fire resistance. Um, some people consider it better than the Phoenix Soul Origin that was in Unearthed Arcana. Which, speaking of that, where what's your, where do you stand on the Phoenix Soul? Actually, play, funnily enough, I played with the Phoenix Soul Sorcerer, they, um, and he did it perfectly effectively. Thumbs up, 
Um, it's not a terrible uh, thumbs in the middle. It's not a terribly interesting subclass, but they have done such excellent work and groundwork here that the it would not take much for the Phoenix Soul to at the very least become a passable play option in this game and probably a lodestone for people who were looking to play something a little bit more simplistic and less mechanically intense. So thumbs in the middle. All right. Um, sea Soul. Try saying that five times fast. Sea Soul, Sea Soul, Sea Soul, Sea Soul, Sea Soul, Sea Soul. Okay, it's a Sea Soul. Oh, Sea Soul. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's what I was this, saying. This got. <laughs> I was thinking Sea Soul because I watched Invincible uh, today. <laughs> uh, but. <laughs> The Sea Soul, so here's the thing, the Sea Soul, I believe, mostly made it into the Storm Sorcerer. It occupies a very similar mechanical niche. Um, so thumbs in the middle, I think it's going to be taken care of. I think that by far the Storm Sorcerer is the, mo is the more interesting manifestation, if you will, of that particular mechanical arc or narrative archetype, the Stormcaller Magician. So thumbs in the, thumbs in the middle, but... It, there's so again, so much groundwork has been laid by this in the base class where I am apoplectic with joy at seeing how many different features I could get a, as a sorcerer, and it would be hard for any subclass to be unappealing in that vein, but it's just that the sea soul would be overshadowed by some of the cooler things that have come out. Mm -hmm. um, stone soul. Ooh. Ha. Huh. I gotta think about this one for a moment. At least it's not a stone ocean. It's not set in stone. Uh, That's a bad uh, joke. Uh, yeah, terrible, terrible. Don't laugh at that. Um, oh, no, I, I'm laughing at your pain, not at, not at the joke. Much appreciated. The... So here's the thing about Stone Soul. Stone Soul actually had some really cool abilities in it. So many cool abilities that I wanted to mix it in in a horrifically mishmashed multi-class character, like with Druid and Ranger levels or Paladin or something like that. All this absolute shenanigans. Because it had one really cool feature where it, you could mark somebody, basically. You could mark an ally with a protective Aegis. And if somebody hit that ally, you could teleport by moving through the rock. It's the fucking sword mage. <laughs> it's the fucking... Yeah. That is yeah, the, the Aegis. That, yeah, yeah, it's the, a rocky version of the Aegis, which I think the sword mage literally just... It was just called Aegis. Yeah, right? that was that was the 4E sword mage's main main, main, main gimmick. And the whole, mar the whole marking thing, that's straight out of fucking 4E. <laughs> right. And... With these particular, with this particular sorcerer subclass, we can go down the line of okay, social abilities. Stone evokes emotions of which are, or ev evokes images of people who are resolute, stoic, can't be dissuaded from their path, can't be pushed around or bullied. There is an obvious social hook there. In regards to the exploration next you have a few different mechanical options there people st stone sorcerers on mountains and stuff like that perhaps they're borrowing some of the climbing uh exploration decks for these other places who knows um but most importantly for mechanical features that these people could get i might give them maneuvers because it was heavily implied in the UA document that these sorcerers would have access to. Basically, they basically got martial abilities, which were, they were meant to use in tandem with um, their sorceress ability. And for these people, for the level up documents, I would just give them maneuvers that they could use in tandem. Some of them would be unique, some of them wouldn't, but they would be something that they could use in tandem with some of their subclass, other subclass features. Mm -hmm. So thumbs, thumbs in the middle um, could get a little bit too mixed up. Could be dipping their toes and dipping their hands in too many pies or whatever it is. Too many fingers, too many pies. Too many fingers, too many pies. Exactly. So that, that could be a problem, but that could be highly appealing for weird people like me. Mm -hmm. 
And lastly, Giant Sword. You, exclu- you excluded the rest of us from weird people. I'm offended. <laughs> I, did, I didn't I didn't want to... Uh... You, okay. I didn't want you, to exclude you from normal people either. Oh, oh, y- y- no, I'm no normie. Fuck that. <laughs> I, I'm just saying I didn't want to be exclusionary in any direction. Uh, it's okay. I forgive you. <laughs> but anyway, the last one that I've got on my list is Giant Soul. We can fix that. Um, let's see here. Giant Soul. Is that really the last one? That's the last one I've got on my list. Huh. Interesting. So, Giant Soul. Well, because we didn't go over any of the PHP ones, actually. Um, let me me see. I've... But while, while you look that up, I'll go over the giant soul briefly. Yeah. I'm going to give this one a, a thumbs up, a tentative thumbs up. It's it's one of these ones which is not terribly um it's not it's it's not to my taste mechanically, but it could be edited to fit with this and it's another one of these it's another one of these subclasses where so much of the groundwork has been done properly. So as to make sure that it would be a satisfying experience, basically, no matter what subclass you were using with it. And these, you know, additional tie-ins, there's plenty of additional tie-ins to the three different levels, which are mechanical, the social pillar, or the combat pillar, the social pillar, and the exploration pillar. They're all over the place. It's just up to the designers to make sure that those are neatly wound together in a satisfying fashion. And I'm reasonably certain that they could do that. Yeah. Um, well, since since you brought it up and since we kind of skipped it, let's go. Let's go with the two um, core entries. The and I'll start with the one that's the more popular, and that's dragons. Um. Thumbs up. I guess no thumbs in the middle. Thumbs in the middle. Thumbs in the middle, because a lot of the draconic features have been not directly ported to this particular document in the by way of the manifestations, but they have their mechanical niche has been covered in this document, and as to whether. Dragonis would be iterated on for a number of secondary features to be placed within grouped together within a subclass. Who knows? Who knows? I think these designers could do it. I think these designers will probably attempt it based on the fact that it's a it's a player's handbook class and they might feel obligated to make sure that they tackle it as a result. Mm-hmm. But uh, as to how compatible it is, I don't know. What is dragonness beyond being a sack of hit points and having a high armor class and being associated with an element? Fifth edition doesn't know. Will these designers figure it out? Um, asking what is dragonness is a is a hard question for fantasy in general because it changes from setting to setting and author to author and mythos to mythos. The dragon reborn is not. It does not look like a literal dragon. I'm. I, I'm not going to comment on that. I'm not going to comment on that. I'm not going to comment on that. We're going to. We're just going to move the tumbleweed aside. <laughs> mm, anger. So, he rarely gets an opportunity to try and, and try and make me uh, baned. It's not so much baned as it is trauma, but still. <laughs> um, le- so lastly, um, wild magic, which we already ca- we already kind of gave a dressing down to earlier in the show. But how compatible would wild magic be? Um, if if I had to hazard a guess, I get the feeling it's going to be thumbs in the middle. It's going to be a thumbs down for this one. I like Wild Magic thematically. I really do. I 
which is why in my Vancean game in my game of Vancean magic which which assumed a Vancean baseline uh for Lords of Brachus, which I was developing I incorporated magical mishaps into the into the like in, into the into the bones of the system to where if you were not meeting checking off enough things when you cast magic which had their own benefits if you sort of overchecked the spell. But if you didn't have enough check marks there, there was a possibility for a mishap. Or a mishap would happen. And there were what the mishap was defined as was was variable. It could be you took damage, could be the spell just poofed into nothingness. Could be that the spell reversed, and the spell reversing was the this big and I promise you this is relevant. The spell reversing was actually a very the most narratively and mechanically open entry on that table of potential mishaps if you screwed up casting a spell because of something I read in Jeffrey Johnson's book Appendix N in which he goes over Cudgel the Clever he goes over the Cudgel saga in which Cudgel at the very end after having achieved victory over his nemesis one of a big wizard and somebody who persuaded him to steal from said wizard and got him into a whole heap of trouble he decides he's going to solidify cement his victory and and cap it off by insisting not insisting insisting e n c y s t i n g putting them in the ground insisting his two adversaries with deep within the earth and he screws up the spell now, there's any number of things that you might interpret from that from that particular event. What does it mean for that spell to reverse? Imagine you're the DM at the table. It could be uh, they're catapulted up into the air and a large plateau rises beneath them. That's one per- potential reversal. Could be that a rocks fly up in their face and kill them with the force of a speeding bullet. Or it could be that he puts himself on the ground instead. Could be that he puts himself on the ground instead, exactly. Could be... As Vance decided, and I had to put a n- note and example in the mechanics here to say that this would usually, the, the confluence of magics that would produce something on this scale could only occur once per season, after which they sort of fled the caster and would be regrouped over time. Uh, everybody who had ever been insisted by that spell would be raised from the earth directly in front of him. What? Anybody who had ever been had that spell cast on them, because it just basically entombs you and puts you in a state of stasis. What in the actual fuck is that? So can you can you imagine an event like that? That's so exciting, and that brings me to the point of why I have such a deep love for the mishaps and accidents and magical oopsies that have such that add flavor and narrative and implied setting and fun to a game even in failure that if it's not in the bones of the magic system i don't think it belongs in a subclass and i think it's i think it's a mistake to try in the first place that's why i give wild magic a thumbs down which i i can i can certainly see that and um I should I should note that <laughs> um of course of course we've ar- we've we've already j- we've joked several times about the so- about the Sorkadin, or however we're saying it this week to stay ahead of to stay ahead of the tax man Palerer. um <laughs> is is the fact that the fact that um because that they um that this is what it's usually a very it's usually a very good match in mo- in most editions in 5e this is this is a very interesting match and I'd say um I'm I may I may change my mind on this when we eventually get to the paladin but I'd say it I'd say it's just as viable he- here as it as it is in core um mainly because of the fact that paladins fuel smite with spell slots and sorcerers got a lot of spell slots <laughs> um, mm-hmm. and grant granted they did have the they did have the disadvantage of being of potentially blowing their load too early 
until Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica came out. And specifically, Illusionist Bracers. It's because let's put equipment cards in my in my D and D. That's exactly what I want. Developed a, I developed Woods of Brackets has its card game element. I know. I'm 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 talking more about the fact that Magic has an entirely different uh, ethos and pathos to its gameplay than 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 a. Uh, D and D does, and so by putting things that make things very easy in Magic into uh, into D and D, you can very no, easily break break things. Wrong. No, but what could possibly go wrong? Plenty of things, and that's why you love it. I know. Yes, I'm g- I'm going to start well, referring I, I to you in my brain as a gremlin. <laughs> I understand the trepidation at what is what was, by all accounts, something of a little bit of a cash grab. I don't know. Have, have Magic the Gathering crossovers ever gone over terribly well in the non-whale market? Um, like what do you mean? What do you mean by crossovers? Do you mean like just Magic the Gathering crossing over into other mediums? I, into D and D specifically. Well, he, the funny thing the funny thing about that is there has been there has been clamor for some for a RPG version of Magic for years. And I'm not entirely sure if just throwing it into D&D is exactly what people wanted out of that. And moreover, I am I do not think Ravnica was the best choice of a block to go with. Because by this point, Ravnica had already gone through three full blocks in MTG. People were fucking sick of Ravnica. I don't, I don't have anything against Ravnica as a setting, but it had, it had kind of overstayed its welcome. Um, because when, it, when I would, when I would ask about what sort of, what sort of setting that people, um, wanted to, wanted to see. Oh, out of, out of a um, out of di- out of a uh, tabletop magic, um, I got more responses for something like Mirrodin, with it with its with that being the start of of stuff like artifact creatures and the like, or um or some of the or some of the older ones like maybe Ice Age, or rather I- Ice Age isn't older in that sense, but mo- but. <sighs> After after all the after all the years, sometimes the sometimes the blocks tend to tend to blur. I wouldn't mind I wouldn't mind seeing Kamigawa, but that's never gonna happen. <laughs> Kamigawa wasn't a uh... Kamigawa was never as popular as people who are fans of Kamigawa wanted it to be. But that's probably because Magic has never really been a game for weebs. Um, the big criticism. With Kamigawa was the lack of gold cards. It's it was ve- it was very clear that they wanted people to play want wanted to play one colored decks with Kamigawa and a lot of pe- a lot of people's decks, especially if they're doing especially if they're not doing draft, are not go- are not going to be um, single color. Yeah, most people like to most people like to do at least splashes or dual colors. And then, of course, you have people like me who are insane and love to do Wuburg. Yeah. Um. Like, a, I'd say, but to, but to be quite honest, I was I was always against I was always against the idea of just bringing in Ma- bring in Magic the Gathering into D and D's rule set, because I feel I feel like that's. I feel like at that point you're just pre- you're just producing another fantasy setting. When it would be far it would be far more interesting to ha- to have a magic system that reflects the whole five colors lands and the and the like. And whenever I've whenever I've seen um, fans try and uh, try and adapt magic to role playing games, that's one of the things that they focus on. Even um. Even some of the people on the Crafty Games forums had created spellcasting feats specifically on the magic colors. Um. Mm. And I think, but 
stuff but stuff like Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica and the plane and the plane shift articles, while they're they're nice and all, for all intents and purposes, it's more D and D than it is magic, and that's the problem that I had with them. Um. Of course, of course, there's the there's the other thing of the of the throw of the lack of theming when it comes to a lot of um, fifth editions expansions that I've brought up in the past, where it's a lot of throw ev throw everything but the kitchen sink into a book. Yeah, there's been a lot of that. Oh, and I'm not sure there's a good way to fix it without you know. Tearing up Watsy themselves by the roots since they're the ones screwing it up. The it's it's already it's already kind of been it's already kind of been grandfathered in, and it's and there's the implication that they seem to care more about um more about modules because they because they want to try and co they want to try and copy the adventure path thing that Paizo does, but they can't but they kind of miss the point. Um, I mean. I could, it could be argued that the that there's some degree of theming with with the um, upcoming Ravenloft book, but that but I still don't. But most of the time, whenever the there's that kind of thing, it's usually just one cl one class and not a whole lot else. Again, the the real work is in the third party, and after um, I'm not I'm not even entirely sure if I de if I'm even gonna be able to do the 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 typical spellcasting system after messing around with spheres of power s so much as I have. Um. But for, but um, more on point. Next week, we'll be ha we'll be having a we'll be having a class entry that is one that I have been looking forward to since we started this particular project because. Oh boy, has this one gone through a roller coaster in the last few years? <laughs> what it, you're blue balling me? What is it? Oh, <laughs> I'll get I'll 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 tell you in a minute. But of course, I do want to sincerely thank everyone for taking the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where they where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>